across a garden from us. Will you come over and speak? And he said, I can't this time, but I will. And he did. He now is the White House correspondent for Politico. And these are the 2012 elections. And he is one of the best reporters in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Gershwin. Hi everybody, thanks for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, thanks to Skip for that introduction. I wasn't sure if he was gonna tell that story today. Or not tell that story. Uh, he saved me from having to uh, reprise at least uh, part of it. It's a tribute to his uh, good humor uh, and open-mindedness that he would invite me to come uh, speak here, uh, given the grief that I caused him about eight years ago. Um, it is true that that story was, uh, I continue to get people call me about it for four years after I wrote it, um, because they shut off the computer, it was the only place you could go to find out um, who had been listed for some time as the top donors at the Clinton Library. So uh, every so often you luck into something, and that was one where I <laughs> lucked into it. I remember, uh, I was telling Skip earlier, uh, trading off with various uh, members of the Little Rock and broader Arkansas community that had come uh, for the first day, the library was, I think, fully open the day after the dedication ceremony. And indeed, they were all trying to um, see where their pavers were that they had paid for uh, in the garden or the uh, plaza in front of the library, and I was trying to write down the donors, so I tried to be not a rude out-of-towner. I, I would pause every so often and let them come up and uh, jot down the number for their paper, then I'd get back in line and uh, start writing down the names of various Saudi princes and uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, so from that humorous note to a more serious subject, uh, so while I do cover the White House and I do work for Politico, um, my basic area that I cover at the moment is largely um, national security and foreign policy uh, issues. I cover legal issues in the Justice Department as well, and obviously the national security foreign policy side of that is a little more timely today than I think any of us would have expected um, in light of the events that happened uh, yesterday uh, in uh, Egypt um, and also in Libya. Uh, so I thought we might start by talking, I might start by talking a little bit about that uh, and how foreign policy and national security issues have played out in a kind of unexpected uh, way in the campaign. People have probably seen what's happened in the last 24 hours, the back and forth between <coughs> President, excuse me, President Obama and Governor Romney. Um, in the wake of the uh, death of the U.S. Uh, ambassador uh, uh, to Libya uh, and uh, at least three other Americans uh, who were over there involved in diplomatic um, work. Uh, it's almost immediately become an issue in the campaign, as, as some of you may know, uh, Governor Romney's campaign put out a statement uh, late last night uh, saying that it was disgraceful what the U.S. Embassy in Cairo had initially said uh, in response to the beginning of this uh, incident when there were promises of demonstrations uh, at uh, the embassy and consulates over a, as I understand it, not an actual film, but the trailer for a forthcoming film that is uh, anti-Muslim in nature and uh, led to a lot of um, uh, negative reaction from people in the Muslim world. Uh, it's, it was kind of surprising to me how quickly it became an issue of combat in the uh, presidential uh, campaign. My assessment of that is that I think that the Romney campaign feels that they're um, behind. There are a few, point, few points behind, and um, we're getting pretty late in the game. Um, it's only 57 or so days till um, election day, and there's a lot of reluctance on their part to just let an entire day, an entire news cycle go um, without them anticipating it. In, it in some way. They kind of took the day off yesterday in large part um, because it was the 9-11 anniversary. Uh, we had thought that Governor Romney was going to make a more detailed statement about his policy in Afghanistan and how it's distinct from the policy President Obama's pursuing. He chose not to do that yesterday, uh, but they were just raring to go with this statement about the um, uh, embassy situation at midnight last night. Uh, perhaps in retrospect raring too quickly because the situation was still uh, still unfolding, and uh, the governor today, uh, the former governor, kind of 
of doubled down on his earlier comments and said that he didn't regret any of them, although I don't think he used uh, the word disgraceful when he went in front of the television cameras today. Uh, we saw also President Obama come out and make a statement on camera, and just within the last few hours, he's also done an interview um, with CBS talking about this um, in some more detail. Uh, we can probably discuss that more later if people are interested in the questions, but I thought it was an interesting way of getting into uh, this whole national security foreign policy issue in the campaign. And what has always struck me as one of the most surprising aspects of this campaign, that uh, President Obama enjoys such an advantage over Governor Romney, uh, the Republican, on the issue of national security. Um, as someone who's kind of covered those issues for the last three and a half, four years, um, I've kind of watched that situation evolve, and I think it's fair to say that no one who was watching it closely in 2009 and 2010 would have predicted um, that this area would be an advantage for President Obama um, at this point in the re-election campaign. Uh, the hope in the White House was that it wouldn't be a real liability for him, but I don't think anybody thought that it would be something where he would actually be able to mock his opponents um, experience or lack of experience uh, at the Democratic Convention as President Obama did just a few days ago. Um, just to retrace some of the history, in 2009, um, we had a lot of controversy about President Obama's uh, promise to close the uh, Guantanamo Bay Detention Center for terrorism suspects. Um, it was an issue that was immediately set upon uh, by Republicans in Congress who vowed to block it, and it was one where poll showed at that time that about two-thirds of, Amer of Americans agreed with the Republicans um, that it shouldn't be closed, or at least that the people there shouldn't be moved um, to the United States. Um, continued to be an area where the president had trouble with traction through 2009. Um, also, you saw towards the end of 2009, the um, uh, bombing attempt on the uh, US airliner headed for Detroit. Um, which caused a lot of concern about uh, whether the administration or the law enforcement community was up to um, handling these issues uh, and how the administration responded, uh, the fact that the suspect was like, read his Miranda rights, so when many people saw it as more of a military attack that ought to be dealt with that way. Um, and then the third sort of uh, checkpoint here in this early period of the Obama administration was uh, the effort to try the 9-11 uh, suspects that were currently at Guantanamo Bay in New York City, um, which was something the president had kind of hinted at in the campaign, not necessarily committed to, but a lot of his supporters uh, in the legal community thought that he had given pretty firm signals that he would be using the civilian justice system and not the military uh, justice system or military commissions to try um, terrorism suspects. So, this became a huge issue of controversy in 2009 and 2010. And uh, again, it was another area where Congress moved to uh, block the president from having his way. Um, it's kind of interesting to note that uh, while the polls showed there wasn't a lot of support for the president's um, positions on these particular issues, there was a considerable debate about why that was. Um, some people said they're inherently unsellable, that no Americans were interested in having terrorists or accused terrorists um, jailed uh, down the street from them at the uh, local state prison, even if security was beefed up. And others said that the president really hadn't made an effort to try to sell the policy to Americans, that when you really want to do something, you give speeches about it, you send out your surrogates to talk about it. And that's something that the Obama administration never uh, really did. Uh, the president made a speech about these issues in May of 2009, and as someone who's been asking the White House questions about them for the last three years, I can tell you they constantly refer back to his speech in the National Archives in May of 2009. Um, that, as much as anything, confirms to me that they never really made a full college try um, to try to convince people on these uh, policies. Why didn't they do that? Um, we have some hints about why. Uh, Ron Manuel, who was the uh, chief of staff at the White House at that time, and uh, who is now the mayor of Chicago and embroiled in a, a different controversy, um, is reported to have said at a staff meeting at the White House in 2009 or 2010, I'm trying to land uh, two 747s at the same time, and you keep flying a flock of birds or a flock of geese in between them. Um, this is supposedly a comment that he made to Attorney General Holder um, about the Guantanamo uh, 
situation. The two 747s were supposed to be, um, you know, to resolve the stimulus uh, legislation or to fix the problems with the economy and to deal with the health care bill. And um, Rahm Emanuel was of the view that this Guantanamo issue and uh, the related terrorism issues were um, not something worth investing a lot of the president's capital in. And so it wasn't ever really invested. And um, uh, Attorney General Holder was not really allowed to go out and make a full case. Whether that case would have ever succeeded, I don't know. It's sort of an unknowable, uh, unknowable question uh, at this point. And then over the course of those two years, uh, Congress kept sending down legislation to the president that was increasingly sort of uh, uh, hostile to his goals on the, um, those issues. And in pretty much each and every instance, the president signed that uh, legislation uh, somewhat grumpily um, with some protests um, to the point where now he basically doesn't really have the authority um, to close uh, to close Guantanamo. Uh, so then how do we get to this point where the president enjoys, according to many opinion polls, uh, a 10 to 17 point advantage over Governor Romney on um, national security issues? Uh, I mean, the most obvious thing, obviously, would be the um, Bin Laden raid in May of 2011 that the uh, president uh, okay and authorized and to some extent directed, um, which really uh, began to turn things around for him on this issue. It was such a high profile event, pulled in a lot of people that probably don't pay a lot of attention to these issues. Um, and there was a big rally around the commander in chief uh, feeling to that. The White House also did some things to try to, I think, exploit that, um, some of which has come back to haunt them a little bit. There have been allegations that they uh, leaked information that was classified or that they shouldn't have put out in their haste to capitalize politically on uh, the Bin Laden uh, raid. Uh, it's certainly true. I don't know whether they leaked things that were classified or not. Uh, to some degree, the president is the one who decides what's classified, so uh, he sort of has the authority to put out information if he chooses uh, to, to do so. Uh, but there's no question that in the days right after the raid, uh, the White House was a lot more eager than other parts of the government, excuse me, to publicize aspects of that operation. Um, we saw sort of hasty and confusing briefings that were presented by the White House in the couple of days after that raid. Um, and those briefings were made despite objections, apparently, from um, Defense Secretary Robert Gates, who said at the time that he had been assured on the day of the raid or the day after the raid that there wouldn't be um, any more detailed briefings beyond one that was given the night that it happened. Um, and in fact, there were a whole series of them and details have continued to come out. And obviously now we have even members of the um, SEAL team that carried out that way uh, writing books about it. So that was probably the seminal event in turning around the president's fortunes, <coughs> excuse me, on the uh, national security and foreign policy uh, front. Um, there were other things, and part of it is largely his uh, giving up on the uh, uh, policies that he laid out before on Guantanamo. Um, he basically s surrendered on that issue. He um, eventually, after a lot of back and forth over the period of about a year, um, gave up on the idea of terror trials in New York City, and that was essentially abandoned, and the suspects that were going to be sent there for trial are now in the beginning of the trial process at Guantanamo. Uh, Bay. And then the other part of this that has, has turned it around for him uh, on this issue uh, and sort of disarmed Republicans is, of course, uh, his use of this very aggressive tactic of drone strikes to uh, take out terrorism suspects, uh, I won't say all over the world, but in a lot of different parts of the world. It's not limited to just Afghanistan or Pakistan, but there are at least four countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, where we know that um, these types of raids have been carried out. Um, drones are now reportedly going to be involved again in the Libya situation and trying to uh, root out whoever it was who was responsible for the attack on the uh, U.S. ambassador there. It's still unclear whether that was sort of a spontaneous effort by uh, local people uh, or whether it was in fact an Al-Qaeda plot. It seems like a, uh, I don't want to say lucky shot, but a um, pretty surprising thing for just a group of um, angry people to be able to pull off to kill the ambassador and several other uh, U.S. people uh, outside the consulate there and to know that they were going to be arriving and so forth and to have those weapons with them to do that. Um, so my gut instinct is that it's probably a little bit more
more um, complicated than that, but we'll have to see um, what develops. But the president's willingness to endorse those kinds of um, aggressive tactics with the use of drones, and we even had the use of a drone in, in at least one instance to target an American uh, citizen overseas and we're all lucky, uh, is another thing that has made him uh, untouchable sort of on the national security issue uh, by Republicans. It's not that he's not open to criticism, he's just not particularly susceptible to the type of criticism that Republicans are likely to level. Um, he's now being criticized by uh, civil liberties groups. Uh, occasionally you'll get some libertarians from the right um, who will criticize him, but uh, it's mostly uh, critics on the left who say that if you look back, for example, at the Democratic Party platform in 2008, um, there's a lot of discussion about uh, excesses of executive power, uh, that uh, things need to be done through Congress, the president doesn't have all this authority to do these things by himself. Uh, if you look at the 20th of 12 Democratic Party platform, all that discussion of excesses of executive power is gone. Uh, the discussion about closing Guantanamo Bay is still there, even though the president didn't mention it in his um, acceptance speech. But it's definitely toned down uh, dramatically, and it's just kind of an insight as to uh, how your perspective on these things changes when you're in office as opposed to uh, when you're criticizing uh, somebody who's uh, not, not in office. Uh, so, the president has uh, come under attack on those issues as well, but he sort of, as I say, is in a position where Republicans um, cannot uh, uh, really uh, lay a glove on him because many of them have advocated those types of aggressive policies um, for a long time, or even more so. Uh, so you've seen Governor Romney, uh, both today and previously, trying to stake out uh, positions where he could criticize the president on that policy and have a fair amount of difficulty um, with it. Why? Well, um, one area he's tried to criticize the president is on Afghanistan. Uh, that's another area where uh, President Obama uh, pursued a pretty aggressive policy. He um, actually surged troops there dramatically after coming in as largely an anti-war president who uh, many people would argue won because of President Bush's um, uh, unpopularity over the Iraq war the president ordered a pretty dramatic surge of troops um, in Afghanistan. Uh, Mitt Romney has decided to criticize him over uh, aspects of that policy, but has never really set out a coherent uh, policy of his own. Uh, he's said that the president shouldn't have set a deadline to get out and, and things along those lines, but at other times he's endorsed the deadline. I think part of what's going on with Romney uh, is that he's caught between two different elements of his own uh, party. You have the uh, Tea Party movement, which uh, is mainly focused on budget issues and not so much on national security issues. But it's definitely not in favor of spending billions and billions of dollars overseas that don't need to be spent. And it's hard to imagine that there would be a lot of Tea Party members who would say, we're interested in sort of an open-ended uh, commitment to war in Afghanistan for as long as it takes, uh, for as much money as it costs, and with some sort of goal of, say, rebuilding the Afghan government. It's just hard to see how a Tea Party person would think that that's a wise expenditure of uh, US resources. On the other hand, the main line of the Republican foreign policy establishment thinks we should be um, involved more aggressively still in Afghanistan. The President Obama's decision to move towards winding down the war um, is a mistake, and uh, that Romney should go after him uh, on those issues that uh, he's politicizing this, and we need to see through the fight um, that President Obama needs to talk more about victory. Um, and so Romney's kind of caught between these two different camps. Uh, as I said earlier, we thought we might get a little bit of an answer as to what direction he was headed in yesterday, but he deferred on us saying it was a 9-11 anniversary, and he didn't want to get into any more detail. I am expecting that when we have these presidential debates um, in about uh, starting in a couple of weeks, and then uh, there's three debates. At least one of them is supposed to be all, all foreign policy. Um, one may be devoted about half to foreign policy. We'll see a lot of those issues uh, fleshed out in more detail. But at the moment, it seems like Romney is trying to um, sort of be all things to all uh, people on these issues because there are folks that are not satisfied with the president's performance on uh, foreign policy or on the economy. Uh, but whenever Romney begins to get into specifics, there's the risk that those critics of the president don't agree with Romney, and then it 
doesn't actually um, net in much benefit. Um, so I thought I would just discuss, since I am from Politico, some of the other uh, issues that I think are kind of interesting uh, that we're seeing play out um, in the election uh, beyond the role of foreign policy. Uh, the map is kind of interesting uh, to folks at the moment. You know, I think we see a lot of discussion of national polls that the president and uh, Governor Romney are neck and neck. Uh, and that's true, but political reporters will often tell you that, you know, it's not a national election. We don't have popular voting in this country. We go state by state and electoral vote by electoral vote. So, um, you know, to say that the two men are neck and neck really doesn't tell you very much. You have to drill down. And when you drill down, pretty much everyone in political circles in Washington seems to agree at the moment that the president is in a more uh, solid position than Governor Romney, which is uh, pretty amazing uh, given the state of the economy being uh, very lack lackluster. may have to do with aspects of Romney's performance um, as a candidate. But again, you're going state by state, so a lot of it has to do with the demographics of each state. A lot of it has to do with uh, the issues in each state. Um, some places that you might have thought would be in great play or contention between the candidates really aren't um, because of uh, local issues. Um, states like Ohio and Michigan um, have been battlegrounds for some time and was thought they would really be in play. Um, it really doesn't look like those states are in much play at the moment. Um, that's attributed in large part to the auto bailout and the president's decision um, to move forward with sort of a government-oriented bailout of those uh, auto companies, something that Mitt Romney um, disapproved of or had at least a different plan for. He had an unfortunate headline about his um, op-ed on the subject that said, let Detroit go bankrupt, which I think he would have probably preferred not to have, to have almost any other headline than that on the piece, which didn't exactly say that. And as people point out, you know, President Obama let those companies go bankrupt, and that's where a lot of this work was done. 